study. I'm just going to do a quick little quip for our online colleagues. If you're tweeting or talking about this event, please be sure to tweet hashtag deep dish dialogues. I hope I got that right. And you can also leave questions in the chat. And as we get through our conversation today, there'll be an opportunity to take questions both from people here in the lab and also those online. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Cal uh, to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about what you'll be making today. Yeah, I'm Calia. I'm a University of Guelph student and a baker at Penn Carden. I'm going to be talking a bit about the ingredients in the process of baking bread. Uh, we're using spent grain from Fixed Gear Brewery, which is uh, our Penn Carden step into the circular food economy and reusing products that would otherwise go to waste. Or pigs. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jess, I wonder if you could introduce yourself and talk sure. a little bit about the circular economy and the work sure, you're doing. Sure, yeah. So my name's Jess Berry. I'm the Community Investment and Engagement Lead at Harvest Impact by 10C. And uh, I started at 10C just last year. And uh, Harvest Impact is working very closely with a number of entrepreneurs in Guelph and Wellington County to try and fund and provide mentorship support for their businesses as they get up and running. So a lot of this work that you'll see today is very creative. It's very partnership oriented. So it's really important that we have the network of support that entrepreneurs and leaders need within the community to be able to grow their business and their ideas. So what I'm going to speak to first is uh, the difference between what we call a linear economy and then a circular economy. And those are really di important distinctions because the circular economy that we're going to demonstrate today is one of the most important things that we can do in terms of fighting some of our planet's like, big, big issues, climate change, biodiversity, as well as pollution. So typically when we're looking at products, we see a product that it's made, we take it, we consume it, so we make it, and then we dispose of it. So this is known as a linear economy. Very much, we're taking a product from a one point and we're taking it to the very end and it's going into waste. What we try to do at 10C, as well as our partners at Our Food Future, is think in circles. So rather than taking a linear economy, we want to switch it into a circular economy. So the great thing about the circular economy, and this is one of the visuals I'm going to show, is that it's a natural system of regeneration. So whatever products come into the cycle, we try and reuse them wherever possible. Some examples of economies and sectors that are reusing products are business or um, building supplies, mm -hmm. textiles, electronics, and of course, most importantly, the food industry. It's a great example of how products coming in can re be repurposed. And one of the um, examples I want to show today is actually from the fruits and vegetable area because produce is a perfect example. It's natural. It's from the, the world where we can grow something and it has its own protection. So typically when you see this is a grapefruit, it's grown and it has its own beautiful peel. It protects the fruit from rotting. It also protects it from drying out. So you take your fruit, you peel it, and normally here, I can show you, Audrey, yeah. you can actually take, take that and feel it. The peel from a grapefruit, you would normally compost yeah. it. That would be probably something they would do. But there's great uh, work being done where this can be converted into peel leather, oh. so bio leather, so other alternatives to animal leathers. Peels like orange and grapefruit can also be used in the cleaning industry mm -hmm. for hand soap and other products. So these are the types of ideas that we at Harvest Impact are trying to propel forward because this will be, the circular economy will be the instrument that we can actually take and make big system level changes. That's incredible. The other piece that I want to demonstrate, obviously, that Cal mentioned was spent grain. And we're glad to have our friend Mike here from Fix Gear because spent grain is obviously the, 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 the ingredient that we use. Spent grain, um, for those that don't know, is the byproduct of what's made to make beer. So this is what Mike has in many quantities <laughs> at Fixed Gear, which we are happy to, uh, to take and use. Mike, do you want to introduce yourself maybe and talk a little bit sure. about the partnership? Yeah. Sure. Uh, my name is Mike Ostrow. I'm the founder and president of Fixed Gear Brewing in Guelph. And this relationship uh, really initiated with, uh, with our neighbors, uh, Julia, who uh, really came to this uh, idea uh, with seeing all the grain that did come out of our brewery. Most of, the, most of the grain is uh, absorbed by a farmer, a local farmer, to feed livestock. Um, and this is a very, very small amount that uh, is going to a greater purpose. Um, it's our most expensive and it's our most, uh, uh, I guess, largest quantity that we use for beer. Uh, and um, it's tasty. It has a lot of nutritional 
uh, values for humans. And, uh, and when Julia came to us with this idea, we jumped on board right away uh, because there's nothing better to see than our grain used in a more purposeful way, mm -hmm. which is this fantastic tasting bread right here. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Thank you. So I have a couple of questions for you, if you don't mind, because sure. I think some people might be interested about how the partnership forged. So you mentioned Julia Grady, the executive director of Ten Carden. So you established a relationship. Do you have any advice that you'd give people for how they could go about setting up a partnership like this in other cities and communities? Well, I think that uh, you know breweries are uh, a place where communities congregate on a, on a regular basis. Certainly, our brewery is located in a highly densely populated area of Guelph, so it's a high walkability score. A lot of uh, neighbors actually do come and uh, scoop out the grain once it comes out of uh, the brewery. It's fresh and it can be used for a number of ways. So. Uh, I think most breweries, most craft breweries, um, would be excited to participate and donate mm -hmm. anything that they could to have a greater cause, especially with spent grains. It is, like I said, our most expensive and valuable commodity that goes mm -hmm. into the brewing process. Um, and there is really, I think, so much more opportunity. Um, we're currently using it even for dog treats. Yeah. And uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's a great way. We're a dog-friendly brewery, so nothing better. And sort of organically came together just because dogs were in the brewery and, uh, you know, they sniff the, and, you know, they'll eat the grain. So yeah. it's, uh, so it has a, you know, there's just so many possibilities, I yeah. think, that can, that can come out of it. So we're thrilled with the uh, initiative that Julie came to us with. And it's, uh, it's even greater to see how, how, how great a product that she's produced yeah. and Tennessee's produced, really. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. great. So if the grain didn't go to Tennessee and to the, to the bakery, what, what would happen to it? Um, we have, uh, we were approached regularly with, uh, with farmers. Uh, it's a fantastic uh, product for livestock. That's a very common use of spent grain. Probably, I think, uh, almost 100% of all the spent grain that comes out of crap goes yeah. to some sort of use uh, in livestock. Um, and the animals absolutely love it. They chase the pickup truck down the lane. <laughs> as soon as, as soon as, you know, it's, it's often steaming and still warm, and it goes directly uh, to, to that um, the area. So, uh, you know, uh, it's great to see that it is used, certainly anything to avoid putting into the landfill. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I think uh, it's, it's probably the easiest solution just because the farmers do all the labor. Uh, they come pick it up, they transport it, they yeah. feed the animals with it, and so it's very convenient. Um, just from an economic standpoint and, and, and a labor uh, standpoint, uh, we're, you know, once, the, once that comes out of the, the mash tun, uh, you know, we're on to the boil and we're on to yeah. you know, cooling down the wort and putting it into the fermenters. So, uh, so it's very convenient for us as well. It would be great to find a solution to, you know, other than farmers, not that we want to hold back on that, but I think no. there's, you know, that's probably this amount right here is, is maybe uh, one one hundredth of a thousand liter batch of beer. So it's yeah. a very, very tiny amount of mm -hmm. grain. Yeah. Just, it, yeah, could you talk about what it means to nourish in the program that you... Uh... Yeah, so, you know, obviously, Julia, in this wasn't a relatively new idea. We had done our research, but taking, like, really a, a simple bread project and trying to figure out if the base ingredients one of them could be replaced. So flour, if we could reduce our flour consumption and replace it with a product that was already in the system yeah. and it had a high nutritional value like spent grain, what, what, a, what a great way to be able to sell a product. And our hope is that by having our cost be lower and using something like a spent grain, which is already available, that we could take this product and eventually potentially have people purchase it, but then we can do the social enterprise piece where potentially loaves of bread could be donated sure. to those groups that maybe need them for other things. Yeah, yeah. and that's our hope in the future. That's terrific. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Mike. It's great chatting. Much. We might have you back for questions in a All little right. bit, but I think we're going to go. I thank will, you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think we're going to go back over to Kalia, and we're going to walk through some of the ingredients. So I wonder mm -hmm. if you could kind of take us through your next steps. Yes, so for those of you not familiar with sourdough bread, it's a pretty simple process. Uh, we have a, little, a few extra components, um, such as the spent grain, which we process so that it has like a more fine texture. Um, salt, which is really important in any fermenting process. We use 2%, five uh, volume weight. We have some sesame seeds, with sesame seeds which offset the bitterness of the spent grain. We have our sourdough starter and uh, water. The most important part about the water, I think, is that uh, we get the spent grain frozen, so we use the water to like offset the temperature. We want it to be warm so that the, the bacteria is happy and thriving. And then we have our flour. Um, and so we mix all these things together. Uh, some, some sourdough requires a lot of uh, kneading or 
folding, but our recipe is really high in protein, so we kind of forego that step because the, there's enough structure from the protein in the flour. Uh, so we mix it together, leave it for eight hours. That's the bulk rise. And then after eight hours, we return to it, uh, divide it if need be, and shape it. These are the bannetons we use for proofing. They're made with wood pulp, or yeah, wood pulp, and they're made in Germany. Uh, we dust them with rice flour and then cover them with these little cotton sleeves to stop them from drying out. And at this point, you can either do a two-hour proof or you can do a cold proof overnight in the fridge, which really helps develop some of the flavor. And then the following day, we bake it in a Dutch oven at a hot temperature because we want to kill any bacteria that's grown because uh, beer obviously has yeast and sometimes mm -hmm. those bugs, if they're not cooked thoroughly, can, can be... Uh, can be uh, tricky. So then we bake it in a Dutch oven, hot, and what we get is this beautiful loaf of bread, <laughs> which we have here. So Kelly, we're gonna ask you a few questions because yeah. I think during the pandemic, many of us were in the kitchens a lot mm -hmm. more than ever. Yeah, yeah there um, was like a flour there was a, shortage. A flour <laughs> shortage, a sourdough craze. I yes. mean, there were lots of, um, you know, lots of people trying out bread making for the first time. So you mentioned a little bit about the cold proofing. Curious a little bit more about the grain. Do you have any other um, ways that you can boost your bread? Yeah, so spent grain is uh, one way that adds some nutrients. But if you are interested in changing up the flavors, you can use lots of different things. Seeds, nuts. I like to add flax, but you can also do fruit, spices, there's so many different ways that you can make your bread uh, just like a little more hearty. Yeah. And then other than the bread that you're baking, what are the other uses that you've seen for spent grain? I know we talked about a dog biscuit with Mike when he was up here too. Are there any other ways that we're using spent grain in our baking? Yeah, there's, I'm, I haven't personally experimented a lot, but uh, we will be hopefully diving into some different recipes. Granola mm -hmm. is one idea, pizza crust, crackers, um, yeah, savory, sweet. I just feel like there's so many possibilities with it because it has such a, that, like, such a diverse flavor profile. Yeah. yeah. Maybe you could talk a little bit about what you enjoy. I mean, what brought you into baking and, and what have you enjoyed about working on this project? Yeah, um, I, yeah, I have some experience baking sourdough at home. Uh, I've just really enjoyed volunteering for 10 Cardin, so when I heard about the opportunity, I jumped on it, and it's just been, yeah, sourdough, it's like t tending to something, taking care of something, you're like feeding this starter, you're seeing the process kind of, unfold and it's different every time like it has a mind of its own so it's it's just like a process of accepting whatever comes you have to like be able to adapt and it's good for so many reasons we use it a bit of a team sport at, uh -huh. at 10c <laughs> because it takes a lot of people to help uh, feed the starter okay. the schedule in terms of the first feed the second feed and then obviously cal and our other baker monica come in and bake but it's definitely a team sport so when we rock out the week with uh some fresh loaves it's always like yeah we did it mm -hmm. it's great that's amazing and then the facility that you're baking in is in 10 carton can, you, can right. you tell us a bit about that too yeah so uh 10 c is located at 42 carton across mm -hmm. from city hall right it's the old Ackers furniture building and the fourth floor where cal spends their time is the our community shared kitchen so it's a kitchen that can be rented and used by a number of different um, chefs and programs and people that might not have an access to a kitchen it's a commercial kitchen uh, so obviously food handling is, is very important um, and you can rent it as a member of our nourish program and so for any businesses that are interested in kitchen space by all means like check out our website we offer packages on the hour or day basis uh, a few vendors that are at the farmers market use the kitchen to prep their food and take it over in fact when we came this morning uh, Rebel Foods Salsa was uh, getting ready for the weekend market and he's amazing so it's cilantro tomato all you it's, yeah, it's great smells great <laughs> it smells awesome so yeah that's it's a great program to have available and it's a beautiful kitchen beautiful it is kitchen in a great spot it too. was and Julia tells <laughs> us that it was finished probably about a month before the pandemic hit 
in February of 2020. And when it was finished, we, we didn't really know what was going to happen. And then obviously the pandemic hit in March. And really, since the kitchen has operated, it's never been in so-called normal times. And so during COVID, particularly at the beginning of 2020 and throughout the summer, it was an emergency prep kitchen for right. many charities that were serving you know, emergency meals, doing prepackaged drop-offs, emergency food bundles for those that didn't have access to food or couldn't go out for it. And it actually became a real hub for many charities. And that was a wonderful coincidence. But we're looking forward to seeing what else we can do with it in the future. It sounds like a real community space, and I'm smiling because I think that's what many of us are craving as we've come out of a couple of years of isolation and reconnecting with people. And I think baking and food is one of those amazing places yeah. where you connect with family and friends. And I'm guessing you also have had the opportunity to collaborate with other bakers and other people in the community through some of your I work, I think it's too. something, yeah, we're going to continue yeah. working towards yeah. as well. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Okay, I know we have set questions that I need to get back to, but yeah. it was good to learn a little bit more about the, um, about the space that you're baking in. Jess, maybe we could turn back to you to talk a little bit about spent grain and how it can relieve some of the pressures on the food system. Yeah, absolutely. So as we've all learned from the pandemic, you know, relying on a globalized food system mm -hmm. has many, many challenges. Um, not just across the world, but locally in Guelph, Wellington. And if anything, it's shone a bright light on food access for many people in the community, food distribution, and how we consume food. And one of the things we're looking at is if we take spent grain and we're not um, using flour that we would normally use and use spent grain in the process, it helps to relieve some of the pressure that may be flour, like Cal mentioned earlier, we couldn't get at the start of the right. pandemic. It was actually hard to find. So using an alternative like spent grain to replace one of the regular ingredients takes the pressure off. Food prices are going to continue to increase. And so when you look at that overall, helping to reduce the pressure would be great for many, many groups. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, I think we're going to head back to you and we're going to move into the next step. So I'm going to turn it back over to you, Kalia, to talk a bit about your next steps in terms of the, uh, the baking process. Or, or did you cover those things <laughs> Yeah, we already? baked the bread. It's, it's here. I can talk a bit more about the tools that we use. Um, yeah, so the, the key elements, like you don't need a stand mixer when we're making uh, bread in large quantities. We use an industrial mixer. But um, the, the key things is the bench scraper. I'd say it's pretty important. You can do it without, too. Honestly, I didn't have a bench scraper for a long time. But this really just helps scraping the bowl clean, dividing the loaf. I, this metal one is really nice for that, Get, uh, building some of the tension when you're shaping the loaf. Um, and then, yeah, the D Dutch oven is a way of baking the bread without having like steam injectors in the oven because you know you get the nice bakery loaf uh, looks similar to that um, but if you don't have steam injectors you need a way to keep to keep the moisture in um, but also get that oven spring so that's why we use these guys uh, these are helpful for just getting a little sprinkle and we have our heavy-duty oven mitts, which are pretty important when, when I'm touching 16 Dutch ovens that are coming <laughs> out of a 475-degree oven. Um, but yeah, those are, those are, that's most of... That's great. And I'm guessing many people who are watching, and I'm curious too, is where do we buy the bread? So how do we, um, yes. how do we get access to it? Uh, we can... Through Ten Carden, yeah. uh, we sell it. Yeah, so we um, we have our website, Nourish by uh, 10C, and you can go to the website. We have a monthly bread package for $35 where you can order for a month and you get four loaves. Um, but we also have a weekly purchase option. So right now we're baking bread on Fridays, and so pickup is at Fix Gear on Friday afternoons after 4.30, nice. uh, or at 10C between 3 and 5. So yeah, if you're interested in checking it out, uh, we're there. That's and if you, yeah, if you're curious about the process and want to learn how to make sourdough, Minga, which is now uh, owned by 10C, is going to be starting sourdough workshops again in the fall. Yeah, that's great. Yeah.
Um, is there anything else you want to add about the baking process before we move into the next section? And then there'll be time for questions. I think we're you covered think everything. Good. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Good. Um, so just changing gears a little bit, I think um, I'm really happy to be having this conversation with all of you today because part of what I look at in my research is how do you create economies in places? So I'm really interested in kind of this idea of social entrepreneurship, but also place-based economic development. So I think this is a really fascinating example of how do you take something that you already have and asset in a place, whether it's the grain or the skills that people have or the, the governance structure that sits mm -hmm. around it to create an economy. And I know part of what I look at in my research is um, the challenges cities are having, especially post-pandemic. I think mm -hmm. it's been really hard on businesses. Um, I think many people have struggled and I'm really interested in kind of the, how the projects have come together and also the larger food, um, circular food economy that yeah. we're developing in this region. So one of the projects that I'm gonna be working on um, going into the spring months is this idea of community wealth building. So it really approaches it from an asset-based perspective as opposed to a deficit-based perspective. And it looks at what do we currently have mm -hmm. and how do we actually create things around it. And oftentimes in traditional models of economic development, it's often between just businesses and governments, but often the community piece isn't, isn't yeah. brought into it. So I really love this model of the connection between business and community to create something new that then gives back into the community. Absolutely. So I'm really enjoying kind of this dialogue in terms of my research and how it might fit into, yeah. might fit into that. And then how do we create circular economies yep. in Guelph, at Wellington and beyond. Yep. So I wonder if we should turn over to our audience to yeah, maybe ask a few questions. Does that make, I'm, I'm looking over at our colleagues here. They're, uh, <laughs> so maybe we could start if there are any questions in the room. I mean, Mike, you're welcome to come back up and join us because I'm sure there'll be questions for you too. So why don't we start if there's any questions in the room. I see Evan waving. So do you want to get us started, Evan? Sure, thank Thanks. you. I've got questions. Oh, my notes are gone. I've got questions for everybody. Um, Kalia. You mentioned processing the spent grains. Yes. I'm just going to go through all of it. I want to read you. Could you just give us a bit more detail on that? Yeah. Uh, we... Jess, um, any other examples of cool circular food economy yep. projects in the Wealth Wellington area? And Mike, um, you've run a business over the pandemic. Can you talk about how you've adapted in the last couple of years? Give us some success stories. All right, Kalia, Jess, Mike. Okay. All you. right, yeah. So processing the spent grain, we just use a RoboCoop, which is like an industrial-sized food processor, and blitz it. So that helps with the like mouthfeel and the texture of it. It also helps sort of integrate it so that it's like almost more a part of the flour rather than just being like chunks of, of grain that get stuck in your teeth. So that's like a, a huge, really fancy food processor. Yeah, it is pretty fancy. Cool. Thanks. Great. Mm -hmm. So Jess, do you want to talk about other circular yeah, businesses in the region? Sure. Um, so in addition to uh, grapefruit peels and orange peels, there's actually some research happening right now around fish scales. So taking mm -hmm. fish and turning into like a fish leather. That was one that we saw not too long ago. There's also a lot of work being done, particularly around replacements for single-use plastic. So obviously straws, big challenge. And so how can we take uh, going from a plastic straw to a paper straw and then taking from a paper straw, and what do you do with it? Well, there's interest in potentially beekeepers being able to use paper straws that are already used for bee houses. That's something we're exploring. Not sure how it's going to work. Mm -hmm. um, some of the options, uh, some of the, a few of the companies we're working with right now, one is called Friendlier, and they have their own uh, recyclable container, and they're partnering with restaurants. They'd actually done a trial, I believe, at the Sleeman Center back in the, in the winter, to be able to, when you're getting some sort of food takeout, using your container, they use an app to be able to scan it and then your container is reused. So with the growth of a lot of like home delivery food um, services, those types of containers are really important because home delivery for a food based um, business, it, the packaging is a yeah. lot of the waste. And so those types of companies that are repurposing packaging, we've seen mushroom roots being converted into packaging. There's a lot of great work that's happening. One of the big goals of our Food Future, Innovation Guelph, and Harvest Impact is over the next two years to propel up to 40 new businesses in the circular food economy, whether they're already started and they can tweak an idea to have it be fully circular or take an idea from like the seed stage and grow it to make it something. And that's where the key is with plugging into all the partners because you just never know what's going to happen. And my 17-year-old daughter washes dishes in front of your company. So it's oh, very good. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Jess, I wonder if you could talk just for a minute before we switch over to Mike. What kind of communities around these um, enterprises that are beginning? Are there ways that people can learn more about the circular economy, yeah. how to get resources related to that? Is there anything you could share yeah. with us? So after this segment, we're going to actually share a video and uh, a report from Our Food Future. And we work very closely with them on providing sort of like overall work that the community is doing. But uh, 10C, Harvest Impact, and Innovation Guelph are providing a lot of mentorship programs. So being able to plug into the circular economy, who's doing what, financing in the form of loans is a big thing. And providing loans at a rate that the interest rate is manageable enough particularly for people that wouldn't be able to be um, accessing capital at a traditional right. bank, right? Like, those types of things are hard for startups. And so Harvest Impact really takes that point of being able to offer friendly lending, being able to offer you a loan at a low interest rate with small amounts to get you started and mentor you along the way. Because that's really the key, being able to, you know, uh, finish your business plan, be able to pitch it, the like, really common things that business entrepreneurs as they're starting up, they, they need those supports. So working with our network, whether it's the Business Center, uh, Innovation Wealth, those services are critical for, our, for those that are just starting out or have an idea they want to test. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it's great and so interesting for our students who might be listening. So many of our students want to be starting their own businesses and there are resources here at the university for that, through the John F. Wood Center, uh, for business and student enterprise. And I think bringing this concept of the circular economy to our students, many are so interested in sustainability and how do I create something that actually isn't having a negative impact on the environment. So I think this is a really interesting concept to be bringing into our discussions with students who want to become entrepreneurs and in many cases social entrepreneurs as well. introduce the concept of sustainability impact measurement right from the get-go because that's as a social enterprise and as a business those are going to be really important points as you move forward how are you going to measure your impact show us how you're actually changing the amount of flour that you're pulling out and saving whether it be you know a certain amount of product whether it be employing people at a living wage maybe you're um, creating programs that are diverse for all equality, that is really important for all of these businesses and overlaying the SDGs and and having that conversation up front as they think about how they're gonna operate their business is really important. That's excellent. Yeah. Okay, I don't wanna forget the mic question, so Evan, we're gonna turn over to Mike, but you're gonna have to maybe repeat your question unless you remember it. Well, I think it's the uh, the pandemic and you know how we adapted. And right. It's hard to believe, really, if you go back two years, that was when the weight of the pandemic was really starting to fall on everyone's shoulders. Uh, I think as a small business owner and a new business at that stage, uh, it was particularly uh, stressful, and uh, it really did feel like the walls were closing in on us. We had recently uh, expanded to another facility, a production facility, so that was uh, that was a, another concern. And uh, is uh, you know, as the sleep the night, sleepless nights and days started rolling into it, you know, how are we going to, uh, you know, pivot on this? Uh, fortunately, we had uh, an early design to save money to go with a Shopify website. Uh, that Shopify website had a shopping component to it, and uh, it was almost within, you know, minutes or, you know, shortly an hour after that announcement was made that our website started to churn out business. So we very mm-hmm. quickly moved towards... Um, a home delivery business, and uh, we started delivering beer. Yeah. Um, our brewer started delivering beer. I was doing delivering beer sometimes three, four times a day into the night, really whatever it took. Um, but uh, but I think it's you know as as entrepreneurs go and small businesses go, you you really look to ways to adapt because uh, you know it's no different than opening the business, and we just really took that vision and and, and brought it forward. Yeah, and I think as a local business, you also have the responsibility of employing, I'm guessing, a number of people that you want to keep employed through that really difficult time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and we really became such a tight team um, when you look at, uh, you know, how everybody sort of adapted with their jobs and mm-hmm. taking on, you know, how do you map out all the deliveries that you're, you know, you're going to have to do during the day, um, you know, and we did hang on to all of our employees throughout the pandemic, and uh, some were working the canning line, some were doing production, and it was just, uh, you know, really uh, made something that was probably the most stressful, uh, you know, point in time for any any yeah. business. Uh, and we and we started progressing and moving forward. And it's still a big part of our business today is delivering beer online. So that technology, I think, uh, is is here to stay. And uh, it has lots of opportunity. And we've saved, uh, you know, a lot of manpower hours and some inefficiencies mm-hmm. with that too. So mm-hmm. Yeah. And when did the when did the um the, the grain sort of piece with Nourish come in? Was that during the pandemic that that began? 
It was it was through that that we had uh, you know the, these conversations and uh, and Julia is a neighbor of ours, right? Uh, also a friend and yeah. uh, part of uh, you know being a small business owner, we shared a lot of the stresses because as you mentioned, Julia had just opened up that kitchen, yeah. Month, you know weeks before the pandemic started to hit, and uh, so you know with that evolution of what do you do next, uh, you know how can we create different types of products? Uh, that's sort of where the conversation and it's and it has been talked about before mm -hmm. uh, spent grain and bread is is not an, not an uncommon thing it happens um but uh but i think it really paired well and and having a tour julie invited us to uh to tour the facility and once you see that you could really to get excited about you know the spent cranes that are really not uh, using their their useful purpose yeah. uh, into something of a, of a greater good mm -hmm. and, uh, so it was very exciting in part to uh, the pandemic yeah. has to sort of see to fruition these days. Where, where yeah, yeah it's, yeah. <laughs> and it's nice to see sort of the impact of local supporting local, right? Local yeah. businesses supporting other Absolutely. local enterprises as well. So that's a really, it's a really nice part of the story. Okay, we're going to turn back to our audience to see if there are other questions. Oh, sure. Oh, I think There's we have some okay, coming I'll from rush. online. Yes, please, go ahead. Um, Great question. Uh, certainly, uh, having this bread uh, in quantities would uh, would work very well uh, with our current menu to pair it with chili, as an example. Um, and one of the other opportunities, we have a pizza oven there that has a lot of residual heat that's not used over the evening. And with the Dutch oven, it's it's possible that we could extend once you know we uh, look to what Julie is able to offer. It's you know we can start extending it to uh, increase the volume mm -hmm. to handle something that could be really placed on our on our menu. Uh, we do bake bread in the in the oven, but uh, this would be the ideal product, I think, yeah. to pair with uh, with our chili that's on the menu right now. That's great. So the question was just around creating a circular menu. I think the yeah. people online couldn't hear, but I think you answered that really well. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Is there a smaller loaf available for one-time purchase? Ah. Yes, we do make a half loaf as well. As you can see on the counter, those are full loaves. But yeah, if you're interested in a half loaf, those are on the website for order as well, if you want to try it. Yeah, we these um, aren't scaled out, but typically we would have I would put the salt, the water, the sesame, and the spent grain combined first, and and then mix the starter in and just get that like broken up a bit, and then we'll and then we would add in the flour. Yeah, great. So we had a question coming in online, which is similar to this, and I, I wonder if that's where Stacia's going, because many of us try to bake bread at home. Um, so what are some of the mistakes that first-time bakers can make, bread makers can make, and what are the ones that are sort of easily avoidable? So do you have any tips for us? Hmm. Well, I think that one thing that I've certainly faced is just experimenting with the process. Like... A lot of it is temp like temperature dependent. So depending on the room you're in, if you, it's a if it's winter, it's Canada. I don't know. Maybe <laughs> your your house is kind of cold. The, that first bulk ferment will take longer, or sometimes you can overproof it or over ferment it, and then you kind of like the gluten starts to break down. Um, and there's, I mean, there is certainly like. Uh, an attachment maybe to how your bread is going to look. I've made some ugly loaves. They still taste <laughs> delicious. So I think just like just being willing to experiment with the process, uh, try out different things. There's so many resources online. It took me a while to find a recipe that I really like to use. Um, but yeah, just experimenting and uh, look, like using the resources that are available to you, ask other people that are baking questions, mm -hmm. look at YouTube videos. Um, yeah, that's really what I would suggest. That's great. The next question is also for you, so you're going to stay in the hot seat oh, for a fantastic. little longer. This is a very technical question, so okay. somebody must be a sourdough maker. It says, what is roughly your ratio of ingredients to hydration for your sourdough? That's a great, that's a great question. So um, this recipe is 65% hydration with the water. Uh, so that's pretty low. Like, I, I think a lot of, like, San Francisco sourdough bakers are, like, 80% or higher. 
But with the, um, with the spent grain, which also has a bit of moisture in it, the ratio is more like 70 to 75 percent because there's some water content in there. Um, yeah, 65 percent. Any other questions from our audience? There's one more on my sheet, but I don't want to miss anybody if they have a question. Stacia. Um, I, I just think it's such a great example of circularity. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more to how the, the circle continues in terms of who buys the bread and where the, the proceeds go. Yeah, so that's a great question. So um, Maybe just repeat it back. Yeah, so who buys the bread was the question, and where would the proceeds go? That's a great question. So uh, as we sort of alluded to the fact that the kitchen started up just before COVID, we were obviously getting going, um, and we use the funds from this bread, obviously, to... Um, we sell it, and then the money that comes in, we hope in the future, and we're just ramping up now, but we hope in the future that a one-to-one -one ratio, so a one-time purchase of bread, would then be able to have a one loaf shared. So partnering with groups like North End Harvest Market, uh, Chalmers Community Services, groups that are providing like a food access point for individuals in the community, we would love to be able to take the one-to-one -one model and be able to have a purchased bread donate a loaf of bread to those that need it. So with the reduction in hopefully a cost, because we're using an ingredient that is coming to us donated by fixed gear, the price can be adjusted to therefore then give an, uh, an option away. So a true social enterprise, um, and our hope is that this model can be shared with others, and other charities or other businesses can be more social in their work, and that's a real, and we plan to share those case studies in the future for sure. Mm. Great. So we have one more question, and then I think we'll have some wrap-up comments at the end. But the, the next question probably ties in a little bit to my work, but others are welcome to jump in. It asks, where does the circular economy fit in relative to local economic development? So, I mean, the, the concept of local economic development is this idea that um, it's not just about uh, jobs, creating jobs in a community. It's actually about creating places, and it's creating sustainable, equitable places for communities. So that's kind of the thinking behind local economic development, and it's sort of thought of in different waves. So traditional economic development from the 1950s and 60s was very transactional. Businesses come and settle in our community, we create jobs. But the vulnerability communities experience in that is those, those companies can leave and that wealth gets extracted often to, to another uh, part of the country or into a central headquarters. So this idea of local economic development is really about creating economies in place and really supporting communities and looking at other, um, as I mentioned, sort of sustainability quality of life, like what's it like to live where you are, and how do you create places that are equitable um, and have opportunities for everybody. So part of that is around creating local enterprises. Yeah. Social enterprise is such an important part of that too, because it is that circular nature of giving back into the yeah. community. Um, the other project that I'm working on is really this idea of asset-based community development, and we've been doing some great conversations with places like um, Prince Edward County and Fogo Island to talk about what are the assets that you have in place. So rather than looking at it from a deficit-based perspective, what do we need? It's saying, what do we already have? And that really flips the narrative, I think, for communities sometimes. So there's a really kind of cool conversation you can have within your communities, and you can ask some simple questions. What do we have? What do yeah. we love? Yeah. What would we miss if it went away? Yeah. And I like these questions because they actually can be answered by anybody. You could ask your children these questions. You could ask local businesses mm -hmm. these questions. You could ask university students these questions. And they pro probably all approach it in different ways. And then that forms the basis of the asset mapping you can do to begin to then create new opportunities within your communities. And I think the circular economy, it's a newer concept for me, but I'm so curious about it. Um, because it really does feed into that idea of creating sustainability and creating places where community is driving economic development. Yeah. So that's part of where I think the two pieces fit together and um, really interested in the Harvest Impact Fund and yeah. how that's all going to take shape over the next little yes. while. Yeah. Um, so I know we're, I don't know if anybody else, I don't want to, oh, Muriel's got a question. So the question was, where would you get spent grain if somebody wanted to make this bread at home? So Mike, I don't know if I'll you want to take that one. one. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, we brew uh, three, four times a week uh, at the brewery, so they could come to our 20 Alma Street uh, location. They could call ahead of time. Uh, if they're not able to pick it up, uh, we do freeze the grain, uh, similar to what we do for 10C. So, uh, so it is very accessible, and uh, we're just a phone call away. 
-hmm. That's great. So you can definitely call Mike. And I'm guessing if people live outside of Guelph, my sense is that breweries are often very community engaged, just based on Absolutely. what you were saying. So you could yeah. probably call your local brewery and just ask say, the question. Yeah, call your local brewery. Okay, yeah. that's great. Can I also add, we're going to share the recipe at the end of the segment. So you'll be able to see what one loaf in terms of the ingredient quantities to be able to sort of maybe try it on your own at home. That's great. I totally lost my place in the script. So now we're just going to, we've got a few closing comments. Is that good? Yeah, I'm getting a thumbs up, so I feel like we're right on time, so that's good. Um, I just want to take a few minutes to thank the team that's been here today. I don't know about you, but I've really enjoyed this conversation. It's really fun, one, to be back together in place, and then also to learn about this really cool partnership that's happening between Fixed Gear, 10C, and Harvest Impact, and to talk to Kalia about um, the way the baking takes place and how people can access the bread. So thank you all for taking the time to be here. Yep. I'd also like to thank our organizers. It's been great to be brought into the conversation. So Stacia Elliott, Chair of the Hospitality, Food and Tourism Management Program, Rebecca Gordon, who's a graduate student here, Muriel O'Doherty, and of course, Evan Frazier, who's here from the Errol Food Institute. You've all been such great partners to work with and we really enjoyed this discussion. I hope today's conversation has helped us better understand how the circular economy works. I think there's lots of reading you can do, and I'm guessing there'll be links posted where people can learn about this concept a little more. Um, just, just before we wrap up, I know we were thinking, you know, what is the call to action that comes out of this? What can people do? Mm -hmm. And I'll just turn it over to you to offer some final remarks. Sure. Um, the, one of the things we want to touch on is that as a consumer, you know, every action you make, no matter how big or no matter how small, um, is important in a circular economy. So even if it's just learning more about the products that you're buying every day, whether it be at your local grocery store, um, even at like pharmacies or where you're, where you're typically shopping, ask yourself, okay, is this a local product? Is it a product that's made or reused? Being able to support the purchase as a consumer to support those businesses like Friendlier, be able to uh, have actually for them to be able to test their model and be able to see what the results could be would be super important. I think one thing we've learned through all of our, our bread making and our experimenting in the kitchen is that um, designers and brands need to go beyond just simple recycling. If we're going to have fundamental changes within uh, the planet, within the economy, within the community, we need to look at a circular model more. And there needs to be incentives for those types of groups to be able to access those supports, financing. And I think, if anything, that is going to be a critical piece. So as a consumer, learning about how you can think about your purchasing and then learning more. Uh, we're going to share a video from our Food Future After, which I think would be really interesting for people to see some of the great work that's happening. Great. Um, so I just want to make sure people mark their calendars for the next Deep Dish Dialogues, and it's happening on April 21st, and the conversation there will be about plant-based foods, which I know is another really interesting topic. So I think, without further ado, I think we're going to wrap up. I'm getting nods and, and thumbs up, so thanks everybody for being here. It was really fun to be part of this.